My name is Ann Merchant and I'm with the National Academy of Sciences. And of course, I wanna welcome you to today's virtual uh, virtual event, which we are calling the Science of Psychopaths. And we are here, of course, not to see Rick or to see me, but to see Abby Marsh, uh, who will be talking about the Science of Psychopaths. And of course, her conversation partner, Brian Fuller. And of course, but I am joined by I'm Rick Lovard. I'm the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a program of the National Academy of Sciences, which is why I'm here. Exactly. And of course, now it is uh, officially past Halloween, but it's only three days past Halloween. So we thought that we were still in kind of the right time zone to be able to do something that felt like it was right for spooky season. At least that's our story and we're sticking to it. And of course, I always try to make a connection from our topic of the day um, to the work of the institution. And so I did go and type in at the National Academies Press Psychopathy into the search bar for our catalog. And I did find something. I wasn't sure that I was going to. And it was a report that I had actually never heard of. And it was called Threatening Communications and Behavior Perspectives on the Pursuit of Public Figures. And apparently it looks at the way in which um, a lot of the threats that are made online actually translate into physically threatening behavior in the real world. And there is one section of the book that looks specifically at the more likely times that this is to happen when there are people with psychopathic tendencies who are making these threats. Um, so, so there's something in the NAP catalog from the corpus of work from the academies. And of course, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is the journal of the institution, has a lot of articles that look at the way in which um, psychopaths have a, um, a reduced or emotional deficit, um, reduced amount of empathy, reduced amount of regret, uh, lack of altruism. And I think these are things that Abby is probably going to talk about. And I think there's probably, from our point of view, a direct connection for the Science and Entertainment Exchange, the kinds of characters that we oftentimes see um, on television and film. So I was thinking about like Moriarty or Dexter, Alice Morgan from Luther, she was one of my favorite psychopaths. Um, Don Draper, I think probably counts and Hannibal. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons that the Science and Entertainment Exchange looks at this kind of, of science as inspiration for the work of filmmakers. I thought you were going a different direction there. I thought you were going to say the kind of person who works in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I would never say that. I know you have your origins in Hollywood. <laughs> no, no. We love everybody who works in Hollywood. So if you are a storyteller, if you're a writer, producer, studio executive, actor, director, whatever it may be, and you have a question about science, you can call us at 844-NEED-SCI, or you can email us at the exchange at nas.edu, and we will connect you with an expert uh, who can answer your question. We've done this over 3,400 times, including every uh, Marvel film since Iron Man 2, which I think is still true. Um, and we also do it for documentaries and books and video games. So if you do have a question about science, please feel free uh, to uh, reach out to us. We're always happy to connect you. If you are a STEM professional and this is your first time hearing about the work that we do here and you would like to volunteer, we are always interested in uh, connecting with new uh, folks who can provide expertise to Hollywood. Uh, <clears throat> I have to thank today's sponsor, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, thank you so much. Uh, they support our events work directly. Uh, we also get major funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and many individual donors like you. So many people gave this week. Thank you so much. Um, we're, we're really excited to um, have uh, many people sign up this week also at the, um, at the supporter level. Um, and we just want you to know that uh, the money you give goes directly back into the work we do, especially these events. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank Courtney, Jeff, Sachi, Ameche, uh, uh, the team for, uh, you know, doing all the back end work that makes these events possible. Um, today's event, you're going to hear from an amazing person, one of my favorite speakers. We've been, we've had her on our stage many times over the years, uh, and she'll sort of frame things up for about 15 minutes or so. And then um, Brian Fuller will come on. Uh, showrunner, writer, producer of many of my favorite projects over the years uh, to have a conversation with her. If at any time you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. I can see we've got uh, nine or 10 of them already. 
Um, I will be that person on the back end who will be uh, feeding questions to Brian. Uh, so he'll get to as many as he can. If uh, he doesn't get to your question, it is definitely my fault. Uh, and it's probably because I didn't feed it to him. So, uh, you know, sorry about that. We're going to get to as many as we can. We always have more questions than we have time for. Today, we do have a video VIP Q&A after the event that uh, if you signed up for it uh, as a special, uh, you know, different link, you should have that link. If not, please uh, make us aware and we'll make sure you get it. Also, if you are an exchange supporter, if you've joined at the supporter level uh, at any time in the last year, or you're one of our retreat alumni, you should have gotten the link as well. So please let us know if you did not. Uh, so every week we talk about our rabbit hole item, which is a thing that while researching this event, uh, we couldn't take our eyes off of. For me, uh, I found a, an article about a couple of UCLA professors who use statistical model, modeling to estimate how many serial killers in the 20th century may have ended up going uncaught and just dying instead of being tracked down by police. I found that fascinating and terrifying, so I hope you will enjoy that article as well. Wow. Okay. Well, I actually was, I, I came upon this not doing research just by coincidence because I am a subscriber to the podcast, This American Life. I was listening to an episode called The Psychopath Test, um, and it recounts the origin of the PCLR. Uh, it's the psychopath checklist revised. And this was an assessment tool that was created by a Canadian psychologist, Robert Hare. And you can, to, to actually determine um, the prevalence of psycho, psychopathic tendencies, it's mostly used in the court system. You can find this test online. You can take it. Um, so there you go. Um, and Abby can tell us whether this is something we should be doing or not. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I am... We were really happy that we could get Abby on our stage. She is super busy um, all the time, and, and we know that. And as are often the best people, that's how you know they're the best people. But we have been really fortunate to snag her in the past. I was trying to remember how we first learned about Abby's work, because it's been an, oh, you remember. I do remember. It was, I can't remember the person's name, but there was an agent who called me and said, I went to college with Abby and you should know her. She's amazing. Okay. And she's helped me. And so it was actually a filmmaker, sort of filmmaker community person who connected us to Abby originally. Okay, great. Because I couldn't remember. And I know that the first time we heard her give a talk, we were sort of look, Rick and I looked at each other. We're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're getting her back again. And as is often the case at the National Academy of Sciences, once we get our claws into you, and this is true in a variety of circumstances, we just don't let go. We have never let go. Um, so thank you, Abby, for, for not removing our claws and for agreeing to come back. So we will ask you now to turn on your camera and, and prove to us that we have not let you go and that you are here for us again and that we're so happy. I, I know that Jerry Zucker, who is the vice chair of our advisory board, has who's told us that's one of the best speakers you've ever had. Make sure she comes back. So Jeez, no I hope pressure, Jerry's man. out there. This is horrible. This is a horrible introduction. Yeah. I'm never going to live up to it. <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. So thank you so much, Abby, for being here. And thank you for Brian, who's going to join um, afterwards. Uh, Rick, when we were talking about who should join Abby, Rick was like, whoa, 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 wait, no, I know who it should be. Um, so we're really glad I, that we have both of you. I'm really thrilled to have Brian, by the way. We've, we've been trying to get him on the stage for years. So thank you for doing this, Brian. We'll see you in a bit. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to leave, Abby, and we're going to let you do this. Thank you so much to both of you. And in all honesty, for that lovely introduction, I can also tell you, I know exactly who it was who um, gave me the good fortune of being introduced to you. It was my very good friend, Joe Labraccio, who is uh, definitely in the entertainment industry. Okay, so I'm going to get myself set up here and share my screen, hopefully with no technical glitches. So hopefully you can see that. All good. You'll tell me if it's not, I assume. All right. Uh, so yes, I'm Abby Marsh, um, and I'm a neuroscientist and psychologist at Georgetown University, and I study the brains of people at both ends of the compassion spectrum, ranging from extraordinary altruists who donate kidneys to strangers on one end and people with psychopathy on the other. I should also mention I am the co-founder of Psychopathy Is, 
which is a nonprofit organization uh, I launched this year with my co-founder, Lisa Michael, to provide information and screening tools. We also have an excellent self-screener for psychopathy on our site. We also seek to provide assistance to individuals and families affected by psychopathy, as, also, as well as um, fundraise for research for psychopathy, because there's not nearly enough funding for this area. Um, I spent about the last 15 years conducting brain imaging research to try to understand the brains in particular of adolescents with psychopathy, because we know that psychopathy starts young. Nobody develops it for the first time in adulthood. Uh, and I still very vividly remember the day that I met my first such adolescent with psychopathy when I joined the National Institutes of Health group that was studying them. Uh, and the boy, I'll call him Dylan, was housed at the time in a locked ward at the clinical center at the NIH. And before we met him, I heard horrifying stories about him. Uncontrollable violence, family in terror of him, smearing his excrement, theft, con artistry, you name it. And I'm not 100% sure what I expected before I met him for the first time. I mean, I knew that there wouldn't be restraints or manacles or anything. What I 100% did not expect was Dylan. He was uh, straight out of a serial commercial. He was a 14-year-old boy with um, a winning smile and freckles and sandy hair. And I remember having just a lovely conversation with him in his little locked room in this ward. And every conversation I ever had with him was lovely. And that is the really essential paradox of psychopathy, what some people call the mask of sanity, which is that you have this outwardly normal or even super normal appearance that masks really deep internal deficits. So what are those deficits? You can, there are many more than these, but you can really boil them down to about four traits. The first is that they are pitiless. For example, another boy in our study who uh, once called it a total Kodak moment in an interview uh, when he was describing videotaping the screaming, crying faces of his friends and teachers as they streamed out of his elementary school, which they were sure was under attack by terrorists after this boy set up and launched a huge number of highly illegal fireworks at it right after the September 11th terror attacks. Uh, they're also remorseless. So for example, another boy we studied whose mother had ended up institutionalized due to the stress of raising him alone, including losing her job after she missed work repeatedly due to his many suspensions and expulsions from school. When we asked him how he felt about the effect of his behavior on his mom, he said, you know, the things I do hurt her, but she doesn't really say how much so it doesn't have any effect on me. So basically he was blaming his mom for his total absence of remorse uh, for all the negative effects that had uh, occurred because of his behavior. This relates to the third characteristic of psychopathy and maybe the most profound. Uh, and that is that people with psychopathy are loveless. They do not experience close loving bonds with other people in quite the same way other people do. Uh, more than one child or adolescent I've interviewed said that they don't love anybody, not their family, not their friends. Many of them don't have any friends or blatantly say that they think of their friends as, quote, associates. That's a direct quote. Uh, one of the reasons for this, although not the only reason, is that uh, people who are psychopathic are also very narcissistic. Not all narcissists are psychopaths, but um, all people who are psychopathic are narcissistic. Um, and they tend to think that everybody is beneath them. Um, and that doesn't do great things for your relationships. Uh, finally, people who are psychopathic are fearless. Uh, they're really insensitive to the possibility of future harm. In the words of one girl we studied, nothing scares me, hashtag nothing. No consequence seems to slow them down, not the threat of being injured, disapproval, imprisonment, nothing. They do all kinds of daredevilish stuff. Um, one girl we worked with stole her parents' car and took it joyriding so recklessly that she ended up flipping it over and running it into a tree. And she was completely unruffled. The cops showed up at her house later and she was sitting calmly on the couch eating Doritos. Another boy rode his bike off the roof of the school on a dare. Did he break many bones? Yes. Would he have done it again afterwards? Yes. Uh, and they're very antisocial, even in the face of certain punishment. Uh, another boy we worked with broke a bottle over his teacher's face in the front of the classroom. And obviously he was punished for this and he knew he would be punished and he didn't like being punished. So why did he do it anyways? It's because what makes punishment work is fear. So when people with psychopathy reach adulthood, how do they present? Uh, I'd like to show you a short clip from a much longer interview I did with a woman with psychopathy who was a member of our board at Psychopathy Is and whose interview really nicely illustrates the key features of the psychopathic personality as well as how um, deeply normal, except maybe a little bit more charismatic and easy to talk to, many people with psychopathy seem in real life, which is very unlike other 
somewhat similar in neurodevelopmental disorders. So this is Emmy Thomas, who's an attorney and uh, diagnosed with psychopathy and author of Confessions of a Sociopath. And I can talk later about psychopath versus sociopath. I never understood the word psychopathy. I never understood the word psychopath until I was doing an internship. It was during law school and I had a uh, office mate who, you know, this, this internship, it was, it was supposed to be like a nine to five thing, but really we only had like two hours of work per day or something. So we started talking and she was a very interesting person. I think that the nature of the conversations were probably maybe a little bit more open than I realized. After several weeks of this, she said, you might want to consider the possibility that you're a sociopath. And so I just looked it up and found a website that had like, you know, 12 criteria or something, and I kind of read through it, and I was like, actually, this does seem to fit. You know, people had been telling me all my life, you know, think more about others, consider others. You know, what about other people's safety? What about other people's feelings? What about other people's needs? And that was not a very uh, useful thought for me, because I, I was so bad at it. I, I, I mean, it just went so far against the grain that I basically, you know, I was terrible at it. I, I, even if I tried to, I'd forget the next day and then it was like back to the same sort of behavior. And I think one of the things that kind of struck me is that, uh, you know, the, probably the, the labels that I think are, fit more closely are that I, I really didn't feel guilt. You know, I understood that I didn't feel guilt. I understood that people had tried to shame me before into feeling guilt. I remember this time when I was you know, eight or nine or something, we're watching TV and there's this kid on the screen and he was, you know, disabled or something. And I made a joke about it. I made a joke about how he was disabled. And my dad said, have you no empathy? And was just kind of like shocked and disturbed by whatever the joke was. And I thought to myself, uh, what is empathy? And maybe I don't have it because, you know, I, I think I asked him, what is empathy? You know, and he started telling me, okay, you start feeling the, for other people. And I thought, well, definitely I don't do this. I mean, it is one of my more negative traits, especially when, like during my 20s, I call that kind of like the playground stage because that was like when all of my psychopathic traits were at their peak. And if somebody cried, I would get angry with them. You know, I, I thought crying is kind of a, a manipulative tactic because you know I don't understand crying, especially if we had like a close relationship. They were a friend for several years. You know, they know I don't understand the crying. Why are they crying? Almost kind of like a use your words with a toddler thing. That would be my reaction with them. And then of course they just keep crying because it's like a terrible thing to engage with somebody. You're crying, you're upset. You know, so I had a friend whose dad was dying of cancer and like after a while, I just couldn't take it anymore. I was like, you know what? You are way too emotional. I cannot handle your emotion. Let's take a break from each other. And I'm, I think her dad died while we were doing this break. So that I took, you know, I can't handle your emotion while your dad's dying. I mean, now I look back at it and I think that's not being a good friend. But at the time, I just thought, you know, honestly, I do not have the emotional depth, the capacity, the empathy to be able to deal with this. I... All right, so where do these psychopathic personality traits come from? There's a mistaken but pretty common belief that they result from abuse or trauma or quote unquote bad parenting. This is where people also used to think that, for example, autism and schizophrenia came from. And it turns out it, it's not true. It, that's, that's not really the story. Um, Obviously, abuse and trauma can result in lots of really terrible outcomes, um, including some kinds of antisocial behavior, but not psychopathy. All the kids I've described uh, to you so far were from homes that had lots of resources, uh, pretty stable, no evidence of trauma, and the other kids in the family were doing fine. Uh, instead, we think that psychopathy is highly heritable. At least 60% of the variation in psychopathic traits is probably due to genetic factors. It could be even more. There's no single gene for psychopathy. It's probably a lot of genes working in combination in an interaction with a person's environment that results in a gradation of psychopathic traits in the population. Um, it's not like we have psychopaths over here and everybody else over here. It's a continuum with only the very most extreme adults called true psychopaths, at least in forensic settings. You'll note I don't use the word psychopaths any more than I can help it um, because we don't use that kind of phrasing in any other mental health context anymore. We don't refer to people anymore as, for example, schizophrenics or anorectics. 
Um, and so for the same reason, I try to refer to people with psychopathy. Uh, we do know that the severity of these traits is linked to characteristic brain abnormalities that seem to start early in childhood and then sort of progress during development. Um, psychopathy is most reliably linked to abnormalities in a structure called the amygdala. It's a really ancient structure in the brain, not the lizard brain. I want to correct that. It's a brain structure that all of us have, all vertebrates as far as we know. Um, it regulates a huge range of social and emotional functions, but one function it is particularly important for is fear. When sensory information about the world enters your brain, threatening information gets rooted to the amygdala, which blitzes out a reserve, uh, an alert to the rest of the brain. It sends uh, information to the periaqueductal gray, telling you to freeze to avoid being detected by, for example, a predator. It sends information to the hypothalamus, which revs up your sweating and your heart rate and your blood pressure. And it sends information to the prefrontal cortex and other regions of the cortex to help you guide your behavior in adaptive ways and to learn from the threat to avoid it in the future. So now imagine what it would look like if all of these pathways were broken. We know what it looks like actually, thanks to studies of animals like rats whose amygdalas have been experimentally destroyed. So let's for a second take a look at what a typical rat looks like. A healthy rat, um, his amygdala is intact and functioning normally. This is not him, by the way, that you see in the scene. The rat is hiding behind the door on the left and there's a little piece of food in the middle and he's really hungry. He's been deprived of food and is less than his normal weight and he really wants the food. So let's see what happens when the door opens. Okay, waiting for him in the box is a uh, Lego Mindstorms Robogator that simulates a predatory attack. A big, okay, bright orange yellow fang. So you can see, bang, two important things happen when this um, motion uh, uh, stimulated Robogator jumps out at our little rat friends. Um, the amygdala sends him into immediate retreat when he sees the robot, and then he learns. Right now he's more cautious and he's gonna take a lot longer before he makes that mistake again. Okay, now let's see what our rat friend does after uh, scientists use an electrode to fry his amygdala. Totally gone. What does he do now? So once again, he's really hungry, there's food in the middle, and he smells that food and he really wants it. But Robogator is waiting for him, here he comes. Cold as ice. Right? He, he has no reaction whatsoever to this obvious danger. He doesn't try to avoid it. He doesn't try to avoid being seen and he won't learn to stay away from it. This, as it turns out, is exactly how humans with total amygdala damage look as well. Now we don't fry on purpose human beings amygdalas, but there are certain disease processes that can get rid of it. Um, and here are photos of one very famous patient who's completely lacking her amygdala. Her name is SM, uh, handling a massive snake uh, on the left and on the right, you can see this is an image of her trying to touch a venomous tarantula. Um, and, and the staff at this exotic pet store actually had to keep her from handling the really dangerous venomous snakes and spiders. Now, there have been hints for a while, even before we had brain imaging, that the amygdala is probably damaged in people with psychopathy because they too don't show fear and they act a lot like both rats and people who have amygdala lesions. Uh, my group at the National Institute of Mental Health was the first group to test whether the amygdalas of adolescents with psychopathy are indeed malfunctioning, however. So all these kids I've been telling you about, we put them in an MRI scanner like this one and scanned their brains. And while we scanned them, we showed them a series of expressions like these. The faces had one of three possible expressions. They were either angry or neutral or fearful. And these are really important expressions for regulating normal social interactions. Uh, I don't know if you have any guesses as to which ones the fearful expressions were. If you had trouble, if none of these look fearful to you, please feel free to reach out to me later. It turns out that people with psychopathy not only don't experience fear strongly, they don't recognize it in others. It's a basic empathic deficit. If you don't feel an emotion, it's really hard to understand it in other people as well. So these were the two fearful expressions, just in case you didn't know. Uh, so what we were interested in is measuring what was happening in the amygdalas of these teenagers when they were viewing the expressions of fear, which in most people generate a really strong uh, amygdala response, which again, we think is empathic. And what we found is that the more strongly psychopathic these kids were, the less their amygdala responded to fearful expressions. And the less their amygdalas responded, the worse their behavior, the more aggressive they were towards other people. We also found structural defects in the amygdala, such that the structure was over 20% smaller. You can see it with the naked eye. So these are the averages of the, the quartiles of the kids in the study and the most psychopathic adolescents are those on the bottom. You can see that their amygdalas are smaller. That's rare in a brain imaging study. Um, 
And so what we think is going on is these kids are not generating strong fear signals in the amygdala that they should be generating to guide their behavior and decision making. And these findings really nicely reflect their parents' claims that no punishment changes these kids' behavior. What you get in worst case scenarios is really awful cases like this one, a psychopathic teenager who killed three people and here he is literally smirking in the face of three life sentences. This is him at his sentencing hearing. After he entered the courtroom for sentencing, he took off his dress shirt to reveal a white t-shirt underneath that had the word killer handwritten across the front. And then he smirked all through the hearing. And then after being sentenced, he was allowed one statement. And he turned to the victim's families in the courtroom and said, this hand that pulled the trigger that killed your sons now masturbates to their memory. Fuck all of you. And he gave him the finger. And I'm telling you that no punishment will ever change the behavior of a kid like this, unfortunately. What we've learned about the brains of people with psychopathy help to explain how they can be so seemingly cold-blooded because if you don't know what it means to be afraid, you can't understand the fear that other people are experiencing in response to your behavior. This is a quote from a psychopathic felon in the UK who missed every single fearful facial expression and the battery he took, and he knew he was doing badly. And at the end, he said, you know, I don't know what that expression is called, but I know that's what people look like right before you stab them. So just think about what a profound empathic deficit that is. And if you don't even understand why it's bad to make somebody feel that way, of course you would keep doing things that frighten people. Uh, so another uh, psychopathic sex offender, when he was being asked by uh, Bob Hare, the psychologist, why he didn't empathize with his victim, said, well, they're frightened, right? But you see, I don't really understand it. I've been scared myself and it wasn't unpleasant. And I think we can all agree that this is not the statement of somebody who really knows what it feels like to be afraid. Uh, but the good news is that as brain research is advancing, we're getting better understanding what is wrong with people with psychopathy, figuring out how to identify them earlier, and, you know, with the, with the research that we need, we will continue to develop more effective treatments for them than we have right now. I'll wrap up there. Thank you all so much for your attention, and thank you, uh, Rick and Ann, for having me here today. That was great, Abby. I... I have so many questions and thank you everybody for, for joining us uh, in this conversation. One of the things that I'd love to go back to that you said uh, was about the lovelessness and the narcissistic nature of, of a lot of, of psychopaths. I know there, there are people certainly in the chat room who've been diagnosed or suggested that uh, they had some sort of psych, uh, psychopathy diagnosis. And they're like, but I feel love. So, what what are what are the the distinctions for that that kind of loveless uh, aspect of a of, of a of a psychopath um, versus somebody who may be on a spectrum that still has a lot of the more human uh, rational uh, experiences? That's such a great question. Um, what do we mean scientifically by love? Um, and the, the, the best way we have of measuring love is by people's self-report. And this is always a little bit of a fraught thing to do because, of course, we never really know if what my internal experience is like maps onto your internal experience. It's the age-old philosophical question of when I see a banana as yellow, are you seeing it as what I think of as pink? Right. So it could be that somebody who says they feel love is feeling something that isn't quite exactly what most people feel like when they mean love. Um, as best we can tell in um, psychology, what it really means to love somebody is to fundamentally care about their welfare for its own sake. So you care about their welfare, not because of how it affects you, but because it, it's intrinsically meaningful to you. Um, and when I talked to Emmy Thomas um, at one point in a conversation we had, because she would often describe loving her um, various family members, um, and by the way, has good relationships with them. So what I think is really interesting is that even if you don't feel deep love in the way that it's typical to feel it, it doesn't mean you can't have good relationships is the good news. Um, and when I explained to her that scientists, when they say love, mean fundamentally caring about somebody else's welfare for its own sake, she said, yeah, that's not really the way I feel it. Um, so maybe, I think what is usually the case is that people with psychopathy who describe themselves as loving somebody are more likely to mean that they enjoy their company, um, that this person is somebody that they feel connected to, um, and maybe even feel loyal to. Um, so Amy Thomas has described feeling loyalty to people. 
Um, and I think all of those are good and valuable things that can give you a good relationship. The other thing I should emphasize is that, again, psychopathy is a spectrum. And so only the people at the most extreme end of the spectrum would we say are completely unable to feel love in any context at all. Probably people who have psychopathic traits that are relatively high, but maybe not the most extreme, do have some capacity for genuine love. It's just probably not as strong um, and maybe not as frequently experienced as it is for most people. And do you, th do you think that has to do with sort of a, a mirroring uh, of, um, for somebody who's experiencing psychopathy as seeing a bit of themselves or is feeling mm -hmm. seen in some way that, you know, asking on behalf of, of the, the, the fanables uh, that, that may be paying attention that, you know, there's, we often see in, in art and poetry and entertainment a, a love affair with the psychopath or 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 a a somebody with uh who experiences psychopathy being in love or exhibiting love like uh behaviors mm -hmm. and you know that something that you brought up earlier was sort of the the lack of fear and uh a, uh, juxtaposed with people who actually do experience fear because when you said that I was like okay a lot of my bad behavior is a result of fear yeah. so and you know the uh, you know a lot of bad behavior on behalf of a, a psychopath is a result of no fear can you kind of like bridge that spectrum or sort of articulate why uh why it's relatable for those of us who might not be on on that spectrum to still relate to the fear or the no fear mm, yeah these are really interesting questions um first of all coming back to that really interesting question about mirroring and and you know um people you know feeling like or seeing what looks like a really passionate loving relationship with someone with psychopathy um it's important to remember in relationships that people with psychopathy can be who you want them to be. And that is, in fact, who they will be because that is what will get them what they want. And people with psychopathy are not necessarily murderers. I think this is a really, I mean, you know, many people who are serial murderers and, you know, violently vicious uh, are in fact psychopathic. But there are many people who are psychopathic who are not violent or particularly vicious. They just want what they want. And for most of us, we, we, we stop ourselves from getting what we want by hurting other people because we care about them. Um, people who are psychopathic learn how to get what they want from other people, mostly through manipulation. Um, and, and manipulation can often take the form of being a really great friend or relationship partner, at least for a time, right? I will be whoever, I will, I will show you exactly what you want to see. I will be the person you want to be because then you will do the things I want you to do. Uh, and Amy Thomas talks a lot about this, that her, um, until she went through the therapy that got her to where she is today, all of her relationships were fundamentally manipulative and instrumental. She did not have any relationship or honest with somebody. It was all about um, what she could get out of the other person. Um, so when it comes to this interesting fearful, fearless spectrum, it, it is so interesting, right? Because for the average person, fear does drive a lot of our worst behaviors, right? When it comes to, for example, um, violent clashes between groups that almost always is a result of people believing that members of the other group are some sort of a fundamental existential threat to them or their own group, right? Oftentimes, a lot of aggression between groups is, is feels like almost defensive altruistic aggression. I'm, pr I'm protecting those I love from these scary other people who may actually be scary or who you may just have been led to believe are scary. So fear can drive absolutely a lot of our very worst behaviors. Um, and so what's so interesting is we think of fear as a negative emotion. And so it's become um, common for people to talk about being fearless as a virtue. And what's so interesting about psychopathy is it makes it clear that that's not true in any simple way. Um, being fearless uh, makes you really both a reckless person, both with your own safety and other people's safety, and also a really cold person. It gives you the inability to understand when somebody else is feeling really deep distress understanding how to respond to them, understanding how to prevent them from feeling that emotion. And again, you can learn to simulate empathy potentially, um, but you won't, like when push comes to shove, if there's something that you really want and causing somebody else like true gut-wrenching terror is the only way to get that thing that you want, that gut-wrenching terror is not gonna have any real emotional impact on you.
So, so with with that kind of uh, you know the subject that you that that spoke a little bit about, like wow, I'm, I, I have no emotional capacity to to deal with your grief. Um, you know, I, like, the, the narcissism in me is like, oh, I sometimes feel that way. Am I a psychopath? <laughs> so, like, I think a lot of us that are are you know hopefully not identifying with with psychopathy relate to a lot of aspects about the psychopathic experience and is that narcissism or is that just like part of being human yeah i think again and this is i think it's such a good question it really comes back to this idea of a spectrum and most of us are sort of in the middle of the spectrum you know we we absolutely have the capacity to be caring, compassionate people, but there are a lot of contexts or a lot of specific people for whom that capacity just doesn't get turned on. You know, people that we dislike when we're when we're focusing on ourselves and our own problems, other people's distress and um, and fear and anxiety just doesn't really mo move us because we have so many other things motivating us. Um, and the difference between that very normal experience and somebody who's truly has psychopathy is they, they even when they're trying they just can't get it just like i don't i don't understand what that what that feeling is like how, how would a person feel who's being held up at gunpoint and thinks that they're about to die like what would you call that emotion you know that's quite a different thing like if you haven't actually done things that cause other people to feel you know gut-wrenching heart-pounding fear that probably means that you have the empathic capacity to recognize why that's not okay uh, when we, at some of our studies, we ask people who are psychopathic uh, about whether it's morally acceptable to threaten people. And they, they're like, yeah, it's no worse than insulting them, right? And, and they, the reason they seem to make that mistake is because they don't understand that there's something fundamentally different about feeling fear than about feeling, for example, annoyance. It's all just kind of the same, just kind of, just annoyance. <laughs> and, you know, the, the thing, um, you know, you mentioned earlier about, uh, a lot of these people that you're studying, including the guy who's like, yeah, I now masturbate with the hand that, that killed your children. Um, a, is he, like, is there any hope for him? Like, is there any, like, is he going to change? And a uh, follow-up question is, you know, a lot of times that, you know, when we're talking about resources for understanding anything, mm -hmm. uh, so many people don't have access to them. So is yeah. there a blank spot or a, a, a dead zone or a blind spot for, uh, you know, neurologists and, and uh, you know, psychology professionals to, that are like, oh, we're not, we're not getting a lot of data because a lot of this demographic just simply isn't going to have the resources to come to our attention. Two questions, two questions in one. <laughs> it's a really good set of questions. Um, yeah, so the is somebody like TJ Lane, who is, uh, is an example that I have not personally worked with, um, but is a really great example of somebody with psychopathy. Is he somebody who can be, probably, uh, now how much is the sort of open question? There is a myth that psychopathy is untreatable. That's not true. Um, one of the bigger problems with treating psychopathy is just motivating people to want to get treatment. Uh, because again, if you're very narcissistic, you think you're the person who's got all the answers and who's got it right, whereas all the other people who aren't like you are the ones with the problem. Um, and there are a lot of psychological disorders where people don't particularly want to get treated. Bipolar disorder, this is notoriously difficult for many people with bipolar disorder don't want treatment. Um, and so this is not a reason not to try, it's just a reason to be humble about how much we can do. Um, but what we generally tend to think that if people are motivated to get treatment, and if like the woman that I showed you, uh, she was motivated to get treatment because she realized she just kept blowing up her own life. She didn't want to get treatment because she felt like fundamentally she was being immoral. She just realized that if she kept going this way, she was going to end up with, you know, nobody who, who wanted to hang out with her and no job. And eventually she was going to have to change for her own benefit, which is great. Um, and so if you could just get people to see that, that their own behavior is actually making their own life work. So purely selfishly, they should get treatment. Um, there are ways that you can help people understand that there are other ways to think about relationships with people. There are other ways to think about themselves. And you can sort of train them to engage in the kinds of behaviors that are more adaptive. Now, somebody who has already murdered people violently with no remorse, how likely are we to get them to the place where they can actually function well in society? Probably not great. Um, but if we do know that if we can start um, 
detecting children who were at high risk of psychopathy younger, treatments definitely tend to work better if we can find uh, younger children who are at risk and start the treatments early, just like a lot of other disorders, like autism, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have some treatments that work and that have been proven to help. It's just, but the resources issue is a huge one. It's really hard for parents to find resources. And this is just a giant problem with our mental health system in general. You may have seen that Paris Hilton actually recently wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post about this um, camp for troubled teens that she was sent to that was quite abusive. This is the pro this is what happens. I'm not saying Paris Hilton is psychopathic. In fact, I don't think she is at all. But um, but some of the kids who end up at these camps are, and the reason that they end up there is because their parents have absolutely nothing else they can do. Nobody will help them. There's nothing they can do except wait for their child to like, you know, try to murder one of their other children, uh, and then hope that the, the, um, detention system will take them. There's just, there's nothing, there's no options. And so oftentimes these camps are the only option that parents can take. And so this is really, you know, it's a, it's a much bigger problem than any one disorder, but the mental health system really has to step up and give parents who are trying the hardest an option, other than waiting in fear that, they're, that one of their kids is going to murder one of their other kids before somebody will step in and provide them with support. So the best way to uh, treat psychopathy is to appeal to the narcissist? In adults, yes. In adults, yeah. absolutely. In children, no. I mean, the, the nice thing is when you start with somebody who's eight, you know, you, you just do it because when you're eight, like, you know, your parents actually still do have some control over you or four. Uh, the earliest signs that somebody's at risk for psychopathy can emerge pretty early. And and is that significantly different uh, along gender lines or mm. uh, or is it is it like because the uh, the woman that was just speaking, I was like, yeah, she seems like she's, you know, pretty hard uh, that there, you know, is is there such a thing as as gender in when you're dealing with psychopaths? Yeah, totally. It's a really this is a thorny question because the PCLR, which Anne was mentioning earlier, is the you know sort of legendary psychopath test. It's not the only instrument out there for measuring psychopathy, but it is the one that's used most often in the prison system. Um, and what what they like about it in the prison system is that it has a cutoff. You know, if you score 29, you're not a psychopath, and if you score 30, you are. You know, does that really reflect the nature of psychopathy? Not really, but at least it gives you a decision criteria. Um, the problem with that scale, uh, there's more than one, but it's a good scale in many ways, but it was developed in British Columbia in male uh, men in prison. And so it's, I would say it's most sensitive to the manifestations of psychopathic personality in adult men uh, in a prison setting. The minute you go outside of that group, people in the community, women, children, um, I don't think it captures the ways that psychopathic personality can manifest as well. And so we know that women can be psychopathic, um, maybe at a slightly lower rate than men, but there's still plenty of women out there with psychopathic personalities. It just tends to manifest differently. Um, less often in physical aggression, although it does tend to come out in at least some physical aggression, but less often for social aggression, manipulation, sort of deviousness, con artistry, that sort of thing. Um, mainly because, you know, physical aggression is just a much more effective tool to get what you want if you're a large guy um, and can actually intimidate and threaten people. So poisoning versus stabbing. Exactly. <laughs> Good summary. And, uh, you know, is there, um, you know, with, with the empathy or the lack thereof, uh, like with anything, any sort of, you know, neural, not any sort of, you're the expert, but asking the question, if you are flexing the muscle of empathy in a non-empathetic neural structure, will it eventually pick it up? Or is it always going to be, what's that? I don't care. Oh, like, can you train empathy in a brain that doesn't have a lot to start with? That's a great question. This is something that we're trying to figure out. Um, you know, like I said, the, the National Institute of Health and other stuff, they don't have, they don't reserve a whole lot of money for doing psychopathy research. But in theory, this is something that should be possible. Now, I think what's probably the case is that if you have a little bit to start with, so maybe you're not the most extreme end, but you're somebody who's sort of has more psychopathic traits than average. I think you can. I think you can develop that whatever capacity you have. I think if you're at the most extreme end and you've got nothing, it's going to be pretty hard. I, I don't. I think you know there there probably are some people who, um, you know, 
are basically lost causes. But you never know who that person is, you know. And does that does that sort of give you the doorway for the moral question of of the death penalty? Because you're mm. you're like, well, we don't know, so you know, don't do something that you can't undo. Or is there you know legitimate talk in uh, in your profession about mm -hmm. the moral implications of the death sentence for for people that you will, like? you know privately and the in the in the teacher's lounge that you yeah. would go like oh my god you know. yeah uh, or is it is it uh do you just stay away from those types of moral questions and keep them purely scientific oh that's a good question i mean you know i would say there's somewhat separate, although I guess I, I do see the links between them. Um, I will say that in other countries, that it isn't a question. You know, for example, I have colleagues in the Netherlands who study very serious psychopathic offenders there, and that is not a question there. You know, like, oh, if somebody's like so psychopathic, we really can't make them better. I guess we should just kill them. That's not what they think. They, they you know, human life. I mean, here's the thing. I think it's really important to emphasize, and this is one of the reasons I love uh, your work, is that, that it is, it's humanizing. You know, people who are psychopathic, like, I think it's really important to remember that nobody chooses to, to be the way they are. It's, it's really helpful to remember that every psychopathic adult started out as a child who had psychopathy and, a, you know, some sort of snowballing series of events took place and they ended up in this spot. But, you know, now that now we're getting into questions of free will and that is a topic I do stay very far away from. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's certainly the case that that people who who start with this brain that just doesn't seem to empathize very well that's not like they that was a deliberate decision on their part um and so even if they if they cannot if we know that they cannot inhibit their behavior and they are a danger to other people i do think it's legitimate to keep them you know in detention where they can't hurt other people for as long as is necessary before they you know until we come up with a solution that's better and in the netherlands they still do try to treat people with psychopathy i mean they know they're humble about the fact that it's harder but in the prisons there you know you, you treat everybody you try to treat everybody use the best practices you've got try to develop better practices we're always developing better treatments than we've got um and you know and in the meantime treat everybody like a human being which is hard when you know that that person doesn't feel the same level of compassion for you. Um, that's that's where the rub is. But that's what compassion is all about, right? A, a truly compassionate person feels compassion even for people who don't particularly deserve it. So is that just, is that kind of the chief uh, motivator in navigating people who automatically assume if, you're, if you are a, a psychopath that you're evil um, yeah. and that, uh, you know, Evil and you know, evil dies tonight, as we saw in Halloween Kills. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, I mean, that's that's a, a, a it's a dehumanization a dehumanization tactic um, that I imagine as a scientist. There's uh, that's the easiest way to sort of like shirk that mm -hmm. confrontation is is mm -hmm. to go back to uh, what it is to be human. Yeah, it's such a complicated question because, I mean, we know that psychopathy has all the hallmarks of a, of a mental disorder. It is, it, it, like, it officially is. It is every bit as much a mental disorder as depression or autism or schizophrenia or anything, right? It has a very strong genetic component. It, you know, it, it's associated with clear, observable, functional and structural deficits in the brain. You know, it is a mental disorder. And yet, the, when a person's disorder manifests as doing awful things to other people and not feeling guilty about it and seeming to have no moral compass, it's just really hard to think about them through the lens of this person has an illness and needs treatment and help, right? It's just, it, you know, the, the natural inclination is this is a bad person who needs punishment. And then you get into the sticky situation with psychopathy of like, yeah, but the punishment's not going to do much. <laughs> you know, the whole point of punishment is to is to is to cause people to feel bad right humanely ethically bad bad and not want to feel that way again and so avoid doing the bad thing again in the future and or to deter other people from doing that thing but when you're dealing with somebody who doesn't have any strong sense of fear or tendency to avoid things that are threatening you know your punishment's not going to work so i think it all depends on what our goals are if our goals are to satisfy our sort of very atavistic moral desire to punish the bad, you know, the harsher the punishment, I guess, the, 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 the better you serve those goals. But if our goals are to try to have a society where fewer people do bad things to other people, uh, then I think we might want to take a different tack.
Well, is it is it punishment a little narcissistic, if not actively narcissistic, because you're saying like I'm going to punish you for things that you do that I don't like, so I'm in a position of control and power, and I'm in charge of the pencil sharpener as well as your life. <laughs> I mean, certainly in day to day life, if that's your approach, you know, punishing people, you know, who you believe have done something that wrongs you and that you have the right to punish them, punish them, then sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's certainly, it's a little bit self, um, aggrandizing, you know, right. to assume that your moral lens on the world is the moral lens. Now, if that person has, you know, pushed you down the stairs and broken your arm to take your phone, you know, right. <laughs> you probably have the moral authority there. We all saw show girls. We yeah. know it happens. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you but know, somebody, of... oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. You know, somebody asked about uh, teenagers, you know, in our, in our first conversation, we talked about, you know, the the adage of uh, if you do a brain scan of a psycho, an adult psychopath and a, and a teenager, they have the same, you know, neural patterns. So how do you identify a psychotic or a, a, a psychopathic teenager? Oh, because teenagers are sometimes known for their perhaps not the best empathy to start with, you mean? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so what's so interesting about teenagers is that, you know, of course, the, the, the people that we compare these psychopathic adolescents to were other teenagers um, who, the teenagers' problem is not that they can't empathize. I mean, even babies, amazingly, can empathize with other people's distress. So they, they, you know, they notice, they care. Um, they don't always know what to do with that feeling. And then teenagers are also in, a, in a, a moment in their lives where they're, A, they do tend to focus on themselves too much. How are people viewing me? You know, how is this gonna look to other people? And the minute you get really self-absorbed, like teenagers unfortunately sometimes are, you know, we've all been there, um, it, it can cause you to act in a really callous way, even if you're a person who's capable of compassion. And so I think this is an insanely important point is that, People who are completely capable of compassion can do horrible things when they have some other motivation uh, that's even stronger in that moment. People who are psychopathic are not capable of, of real compassion. Most of us are, and yet still other motivations override it. And I think teenagers have so many strong, powerful emotions that other stuff overrides it. Teenagers also have a really big kind of us them distinction, like my group versus other groups. And again, that is that is death to compassion. The, the minute you start forming those really strong group boundaries. You can't sit with us. Exactly, right. And it's and then this could be the same teenager who's like so kind and compassionate and caring to their like grandmother or something at another moment. Uh, and then put him in the wrong setting. What role does rage play with psychopaths? I mean, are they like, like do, are they rageful or are they, is it a different kind of manifestation? Like, is it, is it, is it passion or is it mm -hmm. more calculated and cold? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, cause we, the best of us experience rage, you know, you can't be uh, you know, on this planet in the, in the last few years without being, you know, having something to be rageful about. Um, but does, yeah. does the psychopaths experience it that way, or is it is it much more of a of a, a curiosity? Um, uh, tr people who are psychopathic absolutely experience rage. Um, and the the woman whose video I showed has a really great uh, word for it in her book. I think she calls it white rage or something. It's where like the world seems to go kind of quiet and and you're not kind of in your normal headspace, and you would do just anything in that moment in time. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I don't like the the sometimes used description of people with psychopathy as unemotional. They're not unemotional. They they have some emotions, just not not the ones that keep them behaving morally. They definitely experience rage. Um, it tends to be a little bit briefer, like sort of shorter lived. Like it's a flash and then it's kind of gone again in an almost creepy way. Um, their emotions do tend to have kind of a shallow component to them. Um, but, uh, they can absolutely, if they're, if something they want gets frustrated, there can be a huge rage that builds up and, uh, and causes them to do, I mean, this is sometimes when the really violent stuff happens. If they are frustrated from their goals, will cause rage in anybody. Um, in addition, I should mention that there's the people who study psychopathy divided into primary and secondary psychopathy. What I've mostly been talking about is primary psychopathy. 
There's another thing which is secondary psychopathy, which is people who are probably born with a pretty typical brain. And then due to terrible things that happened to them, they developed really antisocial tendencies and they can look a lot like somebody who's psychopathic, but their problem is like really major emotional dysregulation. So they, they do get really stressed and anxious and then they do get really angry and frustrated. Um, and that's a little bit different pattern. And it's, it's, it, it probably is almost easier to treat because if you can treat the anxiety and the stress and the anger, which we know how to treat, you can get rid of the antisocial behavior as well. But that's where you do it. I mean, people with secondary psychopathy are almost a little bit more impulsive and unpredictable. Um, and so they can be dangerous in sort of a different way. When you say impulsive and unpredictable, uh, is that, you know, emotional? Is that, uh, you know, how, how much are just unregulated emotions and un, uh, untrained uh, minds dealing with emotions in a way that, you know, we could learn something from a civics class in school on mm -hmm. like how to navigate conflict in a way that we're, we're simply not taught. We're sort of left to our own devices, our own emotional devices. Is there, is there an educational component hmm. for uh, just emotional savvy that, that we're missing yeah. out as a culture? That's a great question. Well, um, what's really interesting is that we know that one of the changes that happens during normal adolescent development is that uh, you go, uh, you, you sort of change your style of decision making. Uh, earlier in life and early in adolescence, um, decision making tends to take on a pattern that's known, it, I hate this word because it doesn't really make any sense. It's called model free decision making, where it's kind of based on emotions and instincts and impulses. And as you get a little older and you start reaching adulthood, you're, you start using what's called model-based decision-making, which means you have a, a model of the outcome that you want in your mind, and you're, you're choosing your behaviors to try to get you toward that goal. And there's a lot of um, pretty successful, it looks like, programs that are designed to teach teenagers who have a lot of problem with aggression and antisocial behavior, who may not be psychopathic at all, but they have you know, learned aggression you know, for reasons unrelated to psychopathy. Um, that if you can teach people these two different kinds of decision making, like, and, and, and help them identify, like, you're making decisions that are actually totally counterproductive to what you want, because you're mad in the moment, or you're upset, and like, you just feel like it would satisfy this feeling to, to behave in a way that actually isn't going to help you achieve your goals. And you can teach people to, you know, stop, just take a pause, think about what you want, like, what's the outcome you want, and then what kinds of behaviors will get you there. You know, this is exactly the kind of reason that would help people who are, you know, impulsive, kind of irrational decision makers, um, you know, which includes some people with secondary psychopathy, <laughs> include a lot of grownups. Um, you know, I do think that, that would, that's, it, it's a useful thing to teach people that you don't have to behave the way your emotions are pushing you, that you should think about what you want. And, and sometimes what you want is a better relationship with somebody, um, you know, even if they're making you mad right now. And so just expressing you're mad isn't going to get you the thing that you want, even if it feels satisfying. And what's interesting is kids who have psychopathic traits from a very early age, so they seem to actually develop better planning ability as time goes on because their emotions aren't giving them the right instructions. So they get better at planning to sort of like overcome that deficit. They don't push the button that like zaps them as much. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah, exactly. Do we, do we have a uh, time for just a quick distinction between sociopath, psychopath, and asshole. <laughs> sure. Just because I know it, we, all, we all use those words and I know we all want to use them correctly. Absolutely. Yeah, asshole is the real, is the real catch all. You know, like I think you can, you so know, speak. the Venn diagram, it's the big circle. Um, and, you know, uh, and then the, the people who are psychopathic are, you know, they have these really characteristic problems. They really, it's not that they're just a jerk to you, you know, like you have some long standing beef with them. Like you have to look at their whole life. Like, do they, do they seem not to have any close loving relationships with anybody? Do they really never like go out of their way to help people unless there's something in it for them? When they've hurt somebody, do they never feel bad no matter who it is? You know, that's true psychopathy. Um, now, sociopath is kind of a weird word because it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not really a scientific word. There's no scientific society of sociopathy where there is for psychopathy. 
Um, it's kind of a holdover word from the 90s. Some people used to call people diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder sociopaths. Um, and so you still hear the terminology used sometimes, but it's not really a scientific term. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. My pleasure. That was awesome. And I did not overpromise and you did not underdeliver. So <laughs> there you go, Abby. My introduction of both of you, I feel like, was exactly on point because we know how to pick them and we picked both you guys for good reasons. So thank you for being here. We're going to let you go because we know that people are waiting for you in the, the second Q&A session that we have scheduled. So we're going to let you do that with our thanks because you guys were really awesome. And Rick, you were correct. Um, we have only you to blame for all the questions that there was no way that that Abby and Brian could address. And so we do apologize for there that. Were, there were 230 questions, plus I think a few others. Uh, we'll get to some of them in the VIP q and I'm sure. Uh, apologies, we didn't get to your question. We only got to uh, a very few. Um, I want to make sure we also mention uh, Psychopathy Is. Uh, Sachi, I think, is going to drop a link in the chat if you want to check out uh, Abby's. Uh, she was the co-founder of that nonprofit, if you'd like to check it out. Um, and then, Anne, what have we got on tap for next week? We have Elizabeth Hinton, who is a historian at Yale University and a sociologist, and she will be here talking about, I think the title of our event is Law and Order, America on Fire, which is America on Fire is the name of her new book. And so we will get that. I think the invitation has already been circulated, but we'll make sure to get it out for you. We're also doing an event that actually is an event that is sponsored primarily by the uh, British Consulate in Los Angeles uh, that is marked by COP26. So it's a climate event, uh, which features a uh, scientist from the Royal Society and Lisa Joy, a showrunner and uh, writer producer. So we'll get both those invitations out to you and we will see you maybe once, maybe twice next week. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everybody. See you next week. Bye.